Now, if you're going to um, generate a cross and analyze the data from that cross, you're going to need specialized software. Uh, we're lucky because uh, a great specialized software tool exists. It's called RQTL. R is a programming environment that specializes in kind of statistical interactive, um, it's an interpreted language, works from the command line. QTL is a package inside the R system and there's a website here where you can go and, and grab RQTL and it has additional links so you can download R, etc. We're going to work with RQTL. It's a command line program. I know you guys are very comfortable with it. Uh, a lot of biologists or a lot of people in general are not very comfortable with command line. And for that reason, we have invented a Java-driven GUI interface for RQTL called JQTL. The screenshot on the right is a screenshot of JQTL with as many windows as I could open up to make it look good, uh, showing all the different kinds of graphics that you can generate with JQTL. Of course, uh, whenever you have a GUI, it's more restrictive than when you work directly with a command line. And so we should be able to do everything that we need to do and more in RQTL. And as I said, you'll be spending uh, a bit of time over the next few weeks learning uh, the ins and outs of R and RQTL. Yeah. So the data that you get from an inbred line mouse cross uh, involve uh, three basic pieces. There's the phenotype piece and this is the trait that you measure. Typically you measure a lot of traits but I'll think about just one and blood pressure. So for every individual mouse in our back cross population we're going to measure the blood pressure. We're also going to measure genotypes, and this is an interesting idea if you haven't heard of it. Um, and there's a lot of technical detail uh, underlying how we measure genotypes, but we can at some dense grid of locations over the entire genome essentially reach in and determine whether the individual is homozygous or heterozygous or homozygous the other way. Um, which piece of DNA it inherited from which parent. So these are marker loci where we can reach in and read out the DNA and know whether it's gray or black, so to speak. Uh, the, every individual will be genotyped at a large number of markers. So I have M, I, J with two indices, I indexing the individuals and J indexing the markers. We also have to know where those markers are in the genome. And this is important and a bit of a, of a concept, but there's a, there's a concept of a genetic map. And a genetic map is measured in units that reflect the frequency of recombination. Mm -hmm. So when those chromosomes pair together and exchange bits, they exchange bits pretty uniformly, but not exactly uniformly, along the length of the chromosome. Recombinations tend to be more or less concentrated in different regions, but the genetic map scale is measured in units of probability of recombination. The further two markers are in these centimorgan units, the more likely there is to be a recombination between them. This corresponds roughly, but not exactly, to the physical positions of the markers in the genome. The physical positions would be if you started at the first base of DNA and called it one and then counted them off until you got to about 2.7 billion uh, and numbered them all from top to bottom. Those would be the physical coordinates. And because we have whole genome sequences these days, which is just an astounding achievement and, and believe me, you'll learn a lot about it. Um, because we have these whole genome sequences, we tend to think of everything in terms of the megabase coordinates. But classically, back in the days of Thomas Hunt Morgan, of Centimorgan fame, um, we didn't even know what DNA was. And people were doing genetic mapping and they were measuring the distance between traits and marker loci by the frequency of recombination. The reason I mention that is because we'll often have to flip back and forth between centimorgans and megabases. And one way to do this is to use this tool called the mouse map converter. Here's a cartoon showing us what the data will look like. 
These are the three pieces that I mentioned. If you were to arrange this in a spreadsheet, you could think of the mice as being in the rows and the markers as being in the columns with a little bit of extra space on the left to squeeze the phenotypes in. So every mouse has a blood pressure and there's this column of numbers called the phenotypes and they'll be on the left. Every marker has a position in the genome. It's on a chromosome and it has a centimorgan map position and that would be in the genetic map information in the red band and then the genotypes themselves the A's, the H's and the B's representing homozygous and heterozygous genotypes are going to be in this blue block so phenotypes, genetic map and genotypes all come together and they can be uh, stored in a spreadsheet which makes it particularly easy to work with uh, because you can open these things up in Excel. You have to be careful to save them as comma separated value plain text format files and there's a fairly rigid but simple structure that one has to have the data in to use RQTL and the structure is shown here. I think if the animation works we'll be able to show you um, that the phenotypes are over here on the left. In this case there's an animal number. We've recorded the sex of the animal, in this case as zero for female and one for male. We've also recorded something called PGM and that's the paternal grandmother of the cross and I really need to to set that thought aside but to tell you that Animals have X and Y chromosomes that determine, among other things, their sex. And we really need to keep track of those X and Y chromosomes. And in order to do that properly, we need to know who the paternal grandmother of the cross is. That's an advanced topic in QTL mapping, but there it is. And the weight of the mouse is the quantitative trait of interest in this example. Um, let's see. Here are the genotypes. These are recorded as A, H, and B. A would be homozygous for parent A, if you would. B would be homozygous for parent B. And H is a heterozygote. There's also an NA, which is an uh, indicator for missing. The marker names, which are the names of the DNA markers, are, are shown along the top. In this case, these are D1 rat 246, tells me, among other things, that I know this is a rat cross and not a mouse cross. Uh, we sometimes do work with, uh, with other rodents. Um, all these markers that you see, well, there's one on chromosome 2. Um, these are the chromosome 1 markers. So in this particular cross, we have 3, 6, 8 markers spanning chromosome 1. That's pretty sparse by modern standards. And um, we know where they are in centimorgan units. They start at the very top of the chromosome at 0 0.04 centimorgans, and they span all the way to the bottom, 135.6 centimorgans, with uh, regular locations in between. Here are the gene types. Here's a missing value code. Here's sex and PGM. Oh, and this blank space is extremely important. Please leave that space blank. Um, here's a shot of a genetic map. And I've already discussed centimorgans and megabases. Genetic maps are important for genetic mapping. Uh, the locations should always be in centimorgans. Sometimes you need to know where in the genome a particular gene is and that will often be given to you in megabases so you have to convert back and forth between centimorgans and megabases. At the top of the screen here you can see an R command. This is the command line prompt and I typed in a command called plot.map. I pointed it to my cross data and it drew a graphic image for me which I'm showing you on the screen. The mouse has 19 autosomes X and a Y and a mitochondrial chromosome. Here I'm showing you the 19 autosomes and the X. And the tick marks are showing me where on those chromosomes in centimorgan coordinates the markers are. Again, I'm, I'm looking at this and, and five years ago I would have thought this was wonderful, but our, as you'll see, our, our genetic maps are much more dense these days. These are all the places in the chromosome where we're able to take a peek in and determine uh, what the genotype of the animal is at that location. A lot of time in quantitative trait analysis is spent doing quality control. Mm -hmm. 
I'd be willing to say 80 to 90 percent of your time would be spent doing quality control if we hadn't already done it for you. Uh, you still are likely to run into some of it because it's a it's an iterative process. Uh, the genotype quality control I'm just showing you without explaining too much a couple of plots. This is a comparison of, a, of an estimated with a predicted genetic map and uh, here's a, a, a colorful plot showing the pairwise correlations between the different genetic markers. Uh, genetic markers on the same chromosome should be highly correlated as indicated by the red diagonal. Things that are on different chromosomes off the diagonal should be uncorrelated as indicated by the deep blue color. And here are some R commands. Um, I'm not intending to really go through them in detail, but you get used to seeing them. Command line prompt. Uh, this is an assignment operator. This is how I estimate the map from the data and, and so on. So quality control for genotypes. It's also important to look at your phenotypes, and I want to take a moment just to, um, to review some genetics here. In a back cross, that we start with two parental strains. In this case, I'm calling them A and B. In fact, my cross strains are R, A, and B. And I may measure multiple animals of an inbred strain, and, and the measurements won't be exactly the same. They're going to vary a little bit, and you can see in these histograms of my, my trait values that there's some variability around their means. The A is the low strain. It has a mean of 20. The B is the high strain. It has a mean of 80. But any one animal may be, you know, more or more or less around the mean, um, maybe higher or lower. And that distribution is usually called environmental. It, it may be due to any number of uh, little, little things that differ between one mouse and another. It may also be due to the measurement device. There's just some noise in the measurement device. Whatever it is, because the animals are genetically identical, it's all, all the variability in the trait that's not attributable to genetics. Remember that the F1s are also all genetically identical. So if I measure several F1s, they should also have a pretty tight distribution. And in this case, it's intermediate between the distributions of the two parents, which is pretty typical and, and kind of what you'd expect. The interesting generation here is the back cross generation. And the first thing to note is that it's got more variability. And the reason it's more variable is because every animal in the back cross generation has a unique genotype. So if there are genetic differences, everybody gets like a different shuffle of the deck, you know, a, a different deal, if you would. Um, somebody got a full house and somebody got a pair of twos. And, um, and correspondingly, they have a lower or a higher phenotype. In this case, the range is pretty much bounded by the parents, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes back cross or intercross individuals can have phenotypes that are even more extreme, higher or lower than the parents. The key thing here is that there's more spread. It's really that extra variability that tells you there's a genetic signal in the data. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. Uh, parental generation with low variability, F1 generation with low variability, but a back cross generation that has a lot of variability reflecting the different unique genetics of each back cross animal. Um, one of the most common questions that I get when people talk to me about quantitative trait analysis is they'll say my trait data don't look normal. Mm -hmm. uh, no data are normal, if you know what I mean. Normal means that they have a bell-shaped histogram. No data are ever perfectly normal. It's kind of sort of nice if data are normal because the st statistical methods are most powerful and they work most effectively when data are normal, but it's not a big deal. Having said that, I would always draw a histogram of my data, and here's a trait where I draw the histogram, and it looks pretty bell-shaped. I mean, it's not perfect, um, but I can use a diagnostic plot called a QQ plot. There's a function in R that's called QQ norm that will do this for you. And if the data fall roughly along a straight line, meaning that the actual data look like a theoretical normal distribution. That's a really good one. I rarely see a QQ plot that looks that straight. So that's nice normal data. No need to do anything. Sometimes the data tend to be skewed. 
it's often a right skew. So there's a long, light tail off to the right in this data. There's some very few but very high values. These values are going to be highly influential. And if you don't want them to swamp the signal in the data, you can transform them. Here's the QQ plot uh, also showing you that it's not a nice straight line. I would transform these data. I would either do a logarithmic transform, so take the logarithm, which will squash down those high values and spread out the low ones, or I would do a normal scores transformation, and you'll see both of these techniques going forward. It, we make a lot of use of the normal scores transformation. Um, the other thing you should do when you have more than one phenotype, which is common, is you should look at their correlations. Uh, so here are two, this is actually iron content in the liver and iron content in the spleen. Correlation's pretty good, it's not that great. There are some interesting uh, male and female differences that I've highlighted by using different symbols on the plot. And I'd like to point out there's a couple of animals that kind of fall outside of the big cloud. And you might look at these carefully and wonder if, well, you actually you could see them in the histograms as well. There they are. You might actually ask yourself if those are outliers of some kind. Maybe they were recording errors in the data. It's a lot of QC stuff. But understanding the relationships among traits, I think, is fundamental to understanding, well, how complexity arises. We often look at multiple aspects of the disease. In the case of diabetes, we'll look at the glucose, but we'll also look at the insulin, the leptin, the fat content, a whole variety of things that will often be correlated with one another.